Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. The theme of this talk is metaphoric images as a portal to another realm, another dimension. And I want to start by telling you a few things about my background and how I came to be doing the work that I'm doing now, because it definitely chose me. This wasn't what I expected to be doing in my life. First of all, images are the heart of the creative process, and I grew up in a family that, like the culture at large, valued science very highly and dismissed creativity as unimportant and certainly not real work. So I became a computer scientist. And in my mid-20s, I was working for a large Fortune 500 company in downtown Chicago. I took a weekend trip with my boyfriend at the time, and I had an experience that first night that changed the course and direction of my life. We had traveled to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and driving along the highway at 65 miles an hour, a car crossed the center line and hit us head on. I was wearing a seatbelt, but because of the position I was sitting in the car and the force of the impact, I was critically injured. I broke T12 in my back, and my spinal cord was displaced by 40 degrees. I was given less than 5% chance of walking again by the doctors who eventually examined me at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, where I was airlifted. I did recover from that accident, and I was able to walk again after many months. And there are two parts to that story that are important for this talk today. The first is that that first night when I arrived in the volunteer ambulance at this county hospital in the middle of the night somewhere, in excruciating pain and traumatized, the nurse walked over to me after she saw my condition and she whispered in my ear to imagine that I was floating on a cloud. So I closed my eyes and I imagined myself floating on a cloud and that shifted everything. It relaxed my body, it was comforting. At that point, I was facing the fear of never being able to walk again and that imaginary but very real cloud got me through the trauma. It shifted me into a place of peace, and it got me through the worst pain I've ever been in in my life. And that was my first real experience of the power of metaphor and the metaphoric realm and how central it is for shifts, breakthroughs, and healing. So let's try that right now, just briefly. Close your eyes for a moment and imagine that you're floating on a cloud. The first thing you might notice as you imagine this is that in order to float on a cloud, your body has to be light. What does it mean for you right now in your life to be lighter? And whenever I work with metaphor, the quality that always comes through is gentleness. There's a real beauty and gentleness in the metaphoric realm. So just notice what you notice about floating on a cloud. You might want to notice whether you feel like staying on this cloud, whether the cloud feels like moving or shape-shifting into something else. We're working with the creative process when we work with metaphor, so things are always in movement. I'm going to move on to the rest of the lecture now, but I wanted to give you that quick demonstration to show you how metaphor has the capacity to shift us into a new state and a new way of being, and all it takes is a moment to tap into it. The second part of the accident story that I want to share is this, and it's only in looking back on it years later that I put the dots together. In the months leading up to that accident, I worked out for two or three hours every single day intensely. Intense lap swimming, 
intense racquetball with my coworkers. I was intensely working out in those months. And I've never done that before or since. It was like some part of me, some unconscious part of me, knew that the accident was going to happen and was preparing for it. I recovered from the accident after a spinal fusion and and metal rods, um, but I recovered because my body was in top physical condition. So as I said, that accident changed the course of my life. I was in recovery for a long time, so it gave me a long time to reflect on my life and what lit me up, and I realized that I loved learning. I was working in the artificial intelligence field, so I was trying to be close to learning, working with computers, but I wanted the real thing, and I had become disillusioned with artificial intelligence, realizing that there was no way that computers could replace humans at their best, at their most creative, most realized selves. The creative is where we're most alive. So after this time of recovery, I ended up becoming a PhD student at the University of Chicago, which I never would have done before. It was completely outside of the realm of possibility that I had for my life. It was like the accident bumped me from one life to another, from one track to another. I got a PhD at the University of Chicago in adult learning. My advisor was Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the author of Flow and many other books. And he asked me when I was a student with him to co-author a couple of articles on learning in museums. And if you're interested in those, you can look those up online. So graduate school was a wonderful experience. And when I graduated, my left brain was completely fried. I couldn't look at words without feeling nauseous, and even words on the back of a cereal box made me feel really ill. So for lack of anything better to do at the time, since I couldn't read or write, I started giving psychic readings at the Berkeley Psychic Institute. I had moved to Berkeley, California after I got my PhD. Giving those readings at the Berkeley Psychic Institute turned out to be an important part of my life path and not just a frill thing to do, although I didn't know it at the time. I was just looking for adventure and new experiences now that I was in Berkeley, and I thought I was doing something really crazy and wacky. When I gave the readings, I noticed that I wasn't predicting people's futures. I was going under the surface and reading what I call the metaphoric realm. I wasn't telling someone they were going to meet a tall, dark stranger, I was looking at whatever they were asking about and looking under the surface. I might say something like, you're in the mud right now, but you can move. It's just taking longer than you expected. Or that direction is closed to you, but there's an opening to your left. What does the left direction mean to you? I was looking at their creative process metaphorically. This space, this non-ordinary dimension, is precognitive, and it's the place where we can see things before they manifest in the ordinary world. We can tap in and work with that energy, and that is exciting. So I did psychic readings for a while, but then when I was ready to get serious about my career again, I dropped all that and I started teaching. I taught in the teacher credentialing program at UC Berkeley, and I taught other classes at a few other schools. And I thought that I had left metaphor and psychic readings far behind. So about seven years pass, and I'm interviewing for a teaching position at a graduate school in the Bay Area. And the president of the school in the interview sort of looked at me quizzically, and then he said, instead of trying to fit you into our program and have you teach something on our roster, why don't you tell me what you'd like to teach? And it was a prophetic moment and a prophetic question because spirit spoke through me and said, metaphor. I was in shock. I didn't know anything about metaphor as an academic subject and how it related to psychology. And while I was in this state of shock, the president of the school picked right up on it like nothing out of the ordinary had just happened and said, great, we'll call it the psychology of metaphor. And I walked out of that office not knowing what I was doing or what was going on. 
And the first class I'd be teaching was going to be a class of PhD students that would start in two months. But not surprisingly, since Spirit was speaking through me that day, Spirit developed the class for me. I lived in Marin County at the time, and I liked to work at the San Francisco Graduate Theological Union Library, if anyone knows where that is, on the top of this high hill in Marin County of California. And I'd go up there, and I'd sit at one of the long tables to work, and I'd just glance up from the table, and there in front of me would be some arcane, out-of-print book about metaphor and the psychology of metaphor, and that's how the course developed. One of these books, the most remarkable of them, was by a man named Martin Foss, who wrote a book called Symbol and Metaphor in Human Experience that had been published in 1949 and had been out of print for many, many years. This book was extraordinary about how metaphor is the creative process of life itself. For example, he says, metaphor is the secret of all life. It is the innermost secret of the life of God himself, end quote. So I did some research about Martin Foss because I was blown away by his work, and my graduate students were also blown away by his work. And I discovered that at the time the book was published, Martin Foss was considered by many academics to be a greater philosopher than Martin Heidegger. And for whatever reason, even though there was a lot of interest in this book, It was later listed by the academic scholar as one of the most important and neglected books of the 20th century. And no one academically that I know has ever heard of Martin Foss. So I highly recommend, if you like academic reading and you can get a copy of it, there used to be a few used copies available online. I also set up a Wikipedia page for him a few years ago. And I also have contact with a couple of people who knew him back in the 1960s when he was still alive. They were both profoundly impacted by him. So that's not the end of my story. Teaching this course on the psychology of metaphor was a spiritual experience and a very opening experience for me. It caused me to look at the world differently. I was walking around looking at the world frustrated because I knew there was some realm of beauty that we couldn't see with ordinary eyes, but it was there beneath the surface. And I kept looking around me asking, how do we see that beauty? How do we see that beauty? I wanted to be able to see it, but I didn't know how. About two months after the metaphor class ended, I had a profound, totally life-changing visionary experience where I was shown this realm by spirit, and it was urgently made known to me that guiding people to this realm would be my life's work. I'm an academic, I'm introverted, I love research and writing. I am not by any means a spiritual guru or anything like that. So sharing anything, quote, spiritual is really pretty far outside of my comfort zone. And the reason I'm sharing it with you today is not to talk about myself but because this is depth psychology. This realm of profound beauty is depth psychology. And I'm sure that many of you have had experiences of non-ordinary reality that led you to study and be interested in depth psychology. And these experiences, these depth experiences, need to be in mainstream conversation. They need to be valued and honored and not swept under the rug or dismissed, as I did for so many years. These experiences of otherworldly beauty need to be integrated into the culture as a central way of learning and knowing. This non-ordinary realm urgently wants to be known. 